Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast. And before we get into today's episode, we just have a couple of announcements to make. So, first one, we have the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference coming to Melbourne, Australia in 2019. For those of you who don't know what the hell I'm talking about, this year, in June, we had 10 of the best evidence-based practitioners in the industry come to Melbourne for a three-day conference and it was absolutely epic and we're doing it all over again next year in June in Melbourne and you're going to get to see and hear some of your favorite experts that we've had on this podcast uh, present on all things uh, training, nutrition, fat loss, muscle growth and everything in between. We've enlisted seven uh, presenters so far. So we've got Eric Helms, Mike Isretel, uh, Martin McDonald, Danny Lennon, Brian Miner, James Hoffman, and Gabrielle Fundaro, who is today's guest. So tickets are now available, and we have an early bird discount on offer for the first 30 tickets. So if you're interested in raising the standard of your knowledge and practice, you won't want to miss this one, guys. You can grab tickets via the link in the description box below, and believe me when I say, They're gonna go fast and it's a weekend you won't want to miss. The second thing I wanna also bring to your attention guys is the JPS online mentorship course is open for enrollment. So this is our 12 week course that has been designed specifically for coaches and self coaches who wanna learn more about the science and its application in the real world uh, to training and diet to enhance fat loss, muscle growth, and performance so if you're a coach or you coach yourself and you're wanting to know a little bit more about how to go about being an evidence-based practitioner program write nutrition plans adjust your clients plans to maximize results and understand the theory and principles as well as their application uh, to everyday life then you will get a hell of a lot out of our mentorship course Enrollment's open, as I mentioned, and the course starts in February 2019. It's completely online, and I'm sure all of you will benefit tremendously from that. We have a number of uh, experts in the industry contributing to our course. We've got Mike Isretel, we've got Brian Miner, Danny Lennon, James Krieger, and a host of other uh, presenters from a variety of different fields. So it is a truly evidence-based course. It's not just my spin on what it takes to be an elite level coach. It's the collaboration of some of the best minds uh, in the industry to bring to you one truly evidence-informed course. So without further ado, let's get into today's podcast with Gabrielle Fundaro, who is a Renaissance Periodization Consultant. She's an ISSN Certified Sports Nutritionist and a health coach, and she has uh, been an assistant professor of exercise science at Georgia Gwinnett College and holds a PhD in human nutrition, foods, and exercise from Virginia Tech, as well as a Bachelor of Science in Exercise, Sport, and Health Education from Radford University. Gabrielle's coming down under to the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference, so today I was super excited to have a chat to her and get to know a little bit more about her and what she has to say on all things gut health. So, let's get into the episode, and I hope you guys enjoy. So, welcome back, guys, to episode 53 of the JPS podcast, and on today's episode, I'm honored to have Gabrielle Fundaro from Renaissance Periodization. Uh, For those of you who don't know, Gabrielle is uh, an assistant professor of exercise science, well, was, and has a PhD in human nutrition, uh, foods, and exercise, and she's got a Bachelor of Science in Exercise, Sport, and Health Education. So she is very, very educated, and we're going to be talking about a number of topics related to nutrition and health. So, Gab, first of all, I think it's very important for listeners to have a good understanding of what health is by definition because we often talk about being healthy we want our gut to be healthy that health is important for you know longevity performance fat loss all these things but it's quite an ambiguous and loaded term so do you want to do you want to start off and just give listeners an idea as to what health actually is absolutely um so we have these terms health and wellness 
And people often think that, you know, perhaps health is just sort of the absence of disease. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. And health isn't just about um, physical aspects, but also mental aspects, too. And so when we talk about health, it is an overall um, sort of an effective existence in terms of mental and physical capabilities. Um, certainly, you know, you can be a, you can work on mental and physical health even if you do have a disease. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily just the presence or absence of disease, but it's really living, you know, like people say, you want to live your best life. Um, so I, th I think there's <laughs> the American, a hashtag on Instagram, living my best life. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so the American Health Law and Exercise talks about sort of these pillars of living to, to be able to choose. So you know that you have a choice in mm -hmm. how you want to live your life, to create meaning and to create connections with other people and to be able to enjoy what you're doing. So whether you have the presence or absence of disease doesn't necessarily dictate health or wellness, although it can certainly play a role. If you have the presence of disease and you're not able to manage it well, then you don't, you know, you're not in ideal health. But if you have a, a disease, that doesn't mean that you are precluded from being healthy and being well. And I think that it's important that people realize that, especially, you know, we just had um, World Mental Health Awareness Day, that if you have the presence of, of, you know, even a mental illness, you can still have a healthy lifestyle. You can mm -hmm. still be a well person. Awesome. It sounds like it's very much a commitment to partaking in the activities with our diet, our exercise, and our lifestyle uh, that contributes positively uh, to our overall well-being, both physically and mentally. And you know, I think an important uh, aspect of health is absence of disease, and obviously that relates very much uh, to the gut, which is what we're going to be talking a little bit about now. So gut health, uh, you know, there are many positive aspects of gastrointestinal uh, tract health, and do you want to give uh, some direction as to what does and does not constitute uh, you know, a healthy gut or gastrointestinal tract uh, from a scientific point of view? Absolutely. We don't actually have a specific profile for what constitutes a healthy versus an unhealthy gut. We have a term that we use, dysbiosis. So dysbiosis is sort of an umbrella term that means that you don't have an ideal balance of beneficial and pathogenic bacteria in the gut. Just like we balance the forces of good and evil, we need to actually have both pathogenic and beneficial bacteria in the gut but we just need to have the proper ratio of pathogenic to beneficial bacteria in the gut. What we find is that we actually can see either an enrichment of the pathogenic bacteria or a loss of beneficial bacteria. Those would both be considered to be dysbiosis or a dysbiotic gut. Um, and we have seen that those profiles are characteristic to some forms of bowel disease. So in colorectal cancer, we actually have an increase in harmful microbes, whereas in inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, we have a loss of beneficial microbes. So it's that relative abundance of mm -hmm. beneficial to pathogenic microbes that dictates whether a person has a quote unquote healthy or unhealthy gut. Awesome. And I guess uh, to pick that apart a little bit, uh, let's talk about some of the factors that can contribute uh, to dysbiosis and because we hear a lot of people uh, you know very very worried and concerned that their gut health isn't where it should be and that's affecting their uh, you know ability to lose fat perform their best and their overall uh, well-being and enjoyment of life so how does one uh, you know achieve or how does this bios uh, dysbiosis occur mm. Um, that remains to be determined conclusively because there are so many factors that go into shaping your gut microbiome. Thus far, it looks like probably you have a core biome, so probably about 60% of the microbes in your gut are what they are, and you're not readily going to be able to modify those through diet and exercise. About And, and these these numbers are not going to add up to 100%, just ends up because there's overlap. But it looks like about one third of your microbes are just related to being human. So we have species-specific biomes. 
So about one third of your biome is because you're human. All humans will have these in common. And then about two thirds look like they are more individual. So we have a lot of inter-individual variability in the biome. Of those that are individual, it looks like mm, about 15 to 20% can be accounted for through diet and another 15 to 20% through physical activity. Um, this is based on, uh, in large part, data, because we do have data in both rodents and in humans, but we actually have this really incredible project that maybe a lot of people don't know about. It's called the Human Microbiome Project. It actually ran in um, two phases, and it went from 2007 to 2016. And um, from that project, they were able to determine um, sort of the a baseline healthy biome, assuming that all of the people, because they were healthy participants, this is what a healthy normal biome might look like. It's the reference database of all the uh, sampled bacteria that were present. So keep in mind that you know what we know is from a subset of the population and from uh, epidemiologic studies as well. So we can take fecal samples from people all over the world and then look at some of the correlates, like diet is a is a huge one, or the way that someone was brought into the world if they had a vaginal versus a C-section birth. Um, because that, that human microbiome was actually in two phases. So the first one was sort of just um, looking at the genetic profile of the bacteria and characterizing those. And then the second phase was to look at specific um, events or pathologies that might affect the biome. So things like uh, the way a person is born or the presence of disease. So a lot of people want to know how can they, you know, of that perhaps 40% that is modifiable, how can we do that? Well, you certainly can modify that through physical activity and exercise. The part that we can't, we may not be able to modify that core biome that seems to be very stable looks like it's shaped through events earlier in life. So as I mentioned, if we have a vaginal versus a C-section birth, a vaginal birth, that child will have a little biome that's more closely with his mother and the vaginal biome. Because even though we talk about the gut microbiome, we actually have an oral skin and a vaginal bile, and they all are actually quite different. There's some overlap, but we can identify those when we um, uh, look at the, the genetic profile of the bacteria there. If an infant is born via C-section, they're going to resemble more the mother's skin biome and also the environment of the, you know, the, the operating room. Um, for the first few years of life, the biome is really dynamic and it's adapting to the dietary changes because, you know, infant may have, uh, they may be breastfed, they may be bottle fed, that can influence the biome as well. Then we start introducing solid foods, incre increase the complex carbohydrate content of the diet. Through the toddler years, that's when things start to stabilize and things will stay relatively the same throughout adulthood until elderhood. People who are above the age of about 60, they start to see changes in the biome. Um, so when we're going through life and we're trying to shape that biome in the most healthy way, you know, we can say, you know, a healthy biome, whatever that might look like, it looks like the best ways you can do that really are through eating a plant-centric diet. It doesn't necessarily have to be vegan um, or, or vegetarian. It can be omnivorous, but in both epidemiological studies and randomized control trials in humans and in animals, um, there are strong associations between both the dietary fat and the microbiome and then complex carbohydrates and the microbiome. And it looks like a plant-centric diet, one that's high in complex carbohydrates and high in fiber and relatively low in fats, that seems to support the more beneficial microbes like the bifidobacterium and the production of beneficial short-chain fatty acids. When people ask what constitutes a low-fat diet, usually when we are when we're planning a high-fat diet in research models, it's usually going to be more than 40% calories from fat. So when I say low-fat, I don't mean a restrictively low-fat diet. Really, just in keeping with the guidelines of getting you know less than 35% of your calories from fat looks like it's most supportive of a beneficial biome. Physical activity, um, we don't have a lot of information really on the effects of physical activity on the biome. What we do have, we do have some human and rodent models. It's largely in 
endurance exercisers. So I will put it out into the universe that we need more research on the, the role of the microbiome in resistance training performance and also the effect of resistance training performance on the biome. Um, and exercise is, it looks like it has sort of a dose dependent relationship. So, you know, with any extreme, um, when you apply excessive amounts of stress to the body, you have a point of diminishing returns and that goes for the microbiome as well. That when we have athletes who are exercising in the heat, those who are not um, providing sufficient carbohydrates during endurance exercise and we're doing excessive amounts of training, we actually can see an increase in intestinal permeability and inflammation. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that you know, you're properly planning um, nutrition and periodizing your training to allow for recovery because it's not just for the musculoskeletal system, but also for the biome. Awesome, awesome. So. I guess we started with what will contribute to, you know, a quote unquote healthy uh, biome, but let's get into the weeds a little bit. What does this, what is this biome on a, you know, cellular level? What is it? What is it responsible uh, in doing? And I guess uh, when we're discussing this, you know, the functional entities related to gut health, which everyone seems to get their knickers in a twist about uh, uh, both the microbiome as well as the the GI barrier. So do you want to discuss those uh, two important entities uh, for, for gut health? Absolutely. The gut microbiome is primarily comprised of bacteria. Um, it's about 99% bacteria. We do also have some archaea, which look similar to bacteria, but they're actually different. We may also have um, some parasites in there, although you know I think people sort of overstate the the prevalence of parasitic infection. I've even seen people claim that you know they can't lose weight or something because they have a parasitic infection. Um, it, we're talking about less than one percent. Um, and then we also have viruses as well. So we actually even have a virome. And we can look at the biome in terms of who's there and then also what are they doing. So we have about you know, 100 trillion bacteria in there. There's so much that you can, these, these microscopic organisms, if you were to scoop them all up into a pile, would weigh a few pounds. So there's a lot of biomass in there. And they are expressing thousands of genes. Mm -hmm. So we have not just a complexity in terms of you know, taxonomic who's there, but also just in terms of what are they capable of doing. Um, so those are the different ways that we can study the gut as well. And while we have kind of classically looked at just the profile, we also are, are now moving towards looking at the functionality of the gut. Because even though you may not have um, an acute change in the presence of bacteria following an exercise bout, you could have an acute change of their functionality of what are they focusing on? Are they focus on, focusing on um, repair and construction of their bacterial wall or are they looking at, are they focusing on energy production? So those are just as important as looking at who's there. Um, when we are looking at the biome, we usually organize these bacteria by genetic similarity. Um, we can organize them into something called an operational taxonomic unit. And that, generally speaking, is uh, the cutoff there is about 97% genetic similarity. Um, and to give you some uh, context for that, Human to human have about 99.9% .9 genetic similarity. Looking at a human to a chimpanzee, we have about 98.8% genetic similarity. So 97 sounds like a lot, but it's really still, they, they are still different. And so one of the big limitations in, in earlier research and how we sort of defined a dysbiotic gut or an obesogenic gut was that our specificity of, uh, of taxonomic delineation. So we can organize taxa by very general looking at, you know, for example, the difference between vertebrates and invertebrates all the way down to the species or subspecies level. We were really looking at them at the level of vertebrate versus invertebrate. So early research characterized a specific phylum called the Formicutes as being obesogenic and the Bacteroidetes as being lean. Well, that's like saying vertebrates on Earth contribute more to pollution. 
that really doesn't tell you very much. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we have, there are, there are lots of vertebrates. There are lots of, of organisms that have a spinal cord. And so now you're wondering, well, who exactly is it? So from there, we have to narrow down to the species and subspecies level and say, oh, well, well it's, it's humans. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're really seeing what's going on. Um, and that was really just, you know, early on, it was just limitations in how we could identify the bacteria. If you were trying to just identify them um, visually using culturing, you know, we can rub them on an agar dish and see who shows up. It's very difficult to see specifically who's there. But we can actually look at a genetic level and identify there. We use something called 16S RNA. This is a very conserved portion of genetic information. So we can say that, okay, all bacteria will have this. Now we can look at some specific regions on that gene, and from those specific regions, then we can identify exactly what bacteria we're looking at. But even that has limitations because depending on how deep you sequence a sample and how many times and what section of that uh, genetic information you're looking at, you may still only be able to get down to the genus level. And for an example that I like to use with that is the genus level would be like comparing uh, looking at like jackals and wolves and dogs, all as one group. And even if you get down to the species level, looking at dogs versus wolves. If you were going to, you know, get an animal uh, from a pet shop and, <laughs> and all you know about it is the genus level, you're not going to know whether you're going to get a, a <laughs> dachshund or a wolf. And so those guys are going to have, you know, you're going to have a very different experience with those in your home. And so it's important that we, we move towards looking at um, this in a functional way rather than just, um, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, an identification of who is there. Um, so that was sort of a, a long-winded yeah. explanation for how we can, you know, look at the gut. But um, I think that it's important that people realize sort of how limited we are in, in knowing um, who is residing in our, in our microbial community. Yeah, for sure. And as with any health complication, measurements to determine a state of disease is a requirement before intervention, right? And I think uh, a lot of people with the help of Dr. Google self-diagnose, uh, you know, they feel like they've got a bit of flatulence or they might be bloated one day and, oh, you know, look, Google said that I've got inflammation and I've got an unhealthy gut or a leaky gut, whatever the case may be. And as you've just eloquently outlined, bowel function is an extremely multifaceted uh, phenomenon and there's you know so many factors that go into you know what constitutes a healthy gut. So diagnostic testing uh, is you know, going to be very difficult and it's still quite questionable and unreliable. So do you want to outline some of the ways that you know people can reliably uh, test whether or not uh, their, gut, their gut is healthy, both from an objective but also subjective point of view? You know, I, there, I liken this to the conundrum people point out, you know, why haven't we found a cure for cancer? That's because there is not one type of cancer. Cancer is an umbrella term. And similarly, dysbiosis is an umbrella term. So we haven't found a cure for dysbiosis because there isn't just one cause. You know, we can't, we can't apply just one treatment. And likewise, when people, often the term that's thrown around is leaky gut. Um, we don't know the exact cause of leaky gut. And so even though we can assess increased intestinal permeability, that doesn't necessarily indicate the presence of a gastrointestinal disease. We may see in acute increased intestinal permeability following a high fat meal. We may see it following an extreme endurance event. Um, and we do certainly see it in times of disease but that doesn't mean that those things are always going to coincide. You, you, just because the human body is a dynamic system or constantly adapting. So even if you were to see, you know, you took a lactulose mannitol test and had increased gut permeability at that time, that doesn't necessarily indicate the presence of a disease. A couple others that people um, use are, there's a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth test. You can do that through a breath test. 
So you're fed a substrate that bacteria will ferment and produce gases, and then you can measure the uh, gas production over time. Unfortunately, even though that test, now they are moving towards producing a gold standard method of, of, of administering that test, it does not currently exist as a gold standard. So depending on how a person might administer that, you may get a false positive or a false negative, um, and the accuracy of those tests is anywhere from 20 to 90%. So, um, and, and it's not going to be appropriate for an individual who has diabetes either because they're going to be giving you um, uh, something like glucose. You can use other substrates, you could use like fructose, but in any case, just realize that those are not going to be incredibly accurate. Um, and even in, there was a, a recent study published um, that looked at the potential of small bacterial uh, intestinal overgrowth uh, excuse me, small intestine bacterial overgrowth or SIBO in individuals who've been supplementing with probiotics. Um, and they actually, you know, even the individuals who had tested positive for SIBO didn't necessarily also exhibit the lactate, uh, the excess lactate levels in blood that they were assuming was from those bacteria. And likewise, there were people who tested negative that did have elevated lactate levels. So um, it's not a definitive test. The treatment for SIBO, if a practitioner has determined you have SIBO, that varies widely as well. Um, you know, in, in most cases, they're likely going to uh, 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 prescribe an antibiotic, um, and a lot of people don't necessarily want to use an antibiotic because that will obviously have uh, you know long-term effects. Other people may uh, recommend probiotics or or increased fiber consumption. And that may actually exacerbate the issue because now if you do indeed have an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine and you supplement with probiotics, you may enrich those same bacteria um, or you may be giving them, if you're increasing fiber content, you know, they're going to increase fermentation. So even the treatment for SIBO doesn't seem to be um, consistent. One that is definitely not worth investing time or money in would be the IgG antibody test for food sensitivities. Um, the Academy of Allergenists, Asthma, and Immunology has actually, actually issued a statement saying that this test has never been validated in research um, and it does not appear to be able to do what it claims to do. And that the presence of antibodies does not indicate uh, a, an, aller an allergic response. That uh, antibodies are really just um, an indication that you have seen this protein before. Your immune system has identified this protein. It doesn't mean that you have a food sensitivity or an allergy, which are two different things, and that you cannot eat that food. Um, another one that I have seen recently is an electrodermal food sensitivity testing device. So they actually are usually just, it's, it's, it's actually kind of, it's fake. <laughs> They're using the galvanic skin response. They're looking at the conductivity of your skin um, to then basically manipulate people into thinking that they may have a food sensitivity in response to changes in, in, in skin conduction, which is due to um, for the presence of electrolytes in your sweat. Uh, so just wow. know that those, yeah, yeah, I know. I know. That, that's, that's like, that's like uh, looking at somebody's color of their hair and saying, well, you're definitely this ethnicity. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It is absolutely, yeah, it's the, I was reading some, I and mean, they actually, the, the, the surprising thing is, you know, in some cases we, we, it's not that we don't have evidence against something, it's just that we don't have evidence for mm. it. But in this case, with the electrodermal testing, there is evidence against it. There have actually been randomized control trials showing that it does not test for food sensitivity. Well. Um, yeah, so, so you know, it's, it's unfortunate. And the same thing with the, those IgG tests is that we actually do have evidence that those are not doing the, what they claim to be doing. And so, you know, we don't need to be um, spending or, or wasting money on those things. Um, the other thing is, like I said, we do, we, we do have pathogenic bacteria. And if you were to receive a culture, um, just the presence of something, for example, like H. pylori, just the presence of that bacteria does not mean you have an active infection that needs to be treated. It, it's just, it's like I said, it's the relative abundance. So you may have um, clostridia, like C. diff, 
but there are other different types of clostridia too. So even though you have, you know, perhaps a a, a genus avail a genus present that of that genus there are species that are pathogenic. Again, we run into issues looking at you know what could be pathogenic versus beneficial. I've even seen different uh, interpretations in the research. So in some cases. Um, Lactobacilli may be good because they can produce short chain fatty acids and those are beneficial, but in other cases they're considered to be path not pathogenic but not good because, well, they've taken fiber that we can't extract energy from and they've extracted energy and, from it and produced something that we can then extract energy from. And so that increases the caloric content of the diet. So another example is lactnospheraceae. I see it come up a lot in you know, the limited amount of, of research we have in endurance athletes. It's a butyrate producer. It's beneficial for them. But I've seen other articles that talk about it in a negative light because it's increased in um, children who, whose parents use uh, non-natural you know, chemical grade cleaners. And it's correlated with body weight gain. So context is very important when we're talking about, you know, what could be harmful or what could be beneficial. And I think, you know, a lot of practitioners are probably, you know, meaning well and, and you know, want to help people find out what could be causing their gut issues, but they just are not going about it really in, in maybe the most evidence-based ways. So one of the, I think, easiest ways to determine, you know, if you have an actual food sensitivity is to just do an elimination diet. It's a little bit tedious, but it doesn't cost anything and you don't necessarily have to go to a doctor for it. Um, and, and it's just an easy way to, you know, even though it's, it's sort of anecdotal and, and of one, if you remove a food from your diet, keep everything else the same and your symptoms subside then you know that, um, you know, that was an issue. Of course, for things like um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, mm -hmm. um, celiac, those can actually be diagnosed. And for those, you go to a gastroenterologist or appropriate uh, practitioner in your um, region, and you can be diagnosed with those. And those have to be managed through both, you know, lifestyle and pharmaceutical means. Awesome, awesome, and yeah, you you mentioned a few uh, really good points there that I want to pick apart, and that is the difference between uh, these allergies and intolerances or sensitivities. So, you know, there, there's a huge difference, and people often mistake one for the other. And you know, an intolerance is simply you know relating to the amount of food consumed when it exceeds some threshold level uh, for what the GI tract can't tolerate. But in contrast, uh, you know, an allergy is an autoimmune response. It's something quite serious. So, uh, you know, do you want to discuss what the difference is in terms of uh, the, the funct functional differences between these two things, as well as, uh, you know, how people can tell and identify whether or not they have one or the other, because they'll know if, they, <laughs> if they're allergic. But uh, do you want to just get into that? Yes. So an allergy is a response to a specific protein that's found in a, in a food. Your immune system is responding to the presence of that protein and it's mounting a response and it can be life threatening. Um, you know, it could cause something as minor as perhaps I, my, hives aren't terribly minor, but hives aren't necessarily life threatening or it could uh, induce full on anaphylactic shock, airways close, and that can be life threatening. So that is an allergy. An intolerance or a sensitivity is not necessarily associated with a protein in a food. So one example is lactose intolerance. Lactose is not a protein. Lactose is a sugar. And that intolerance is just due to the deficiency of the lactase enzyme that would normally break apart that sugar. And instead of you breaking it apart, bacteria break it apart and they produce gas from that. And so you'll have gastrointestinal upset from from intolerances, and they usually do present as just gas, bloating, perhaps diarrhea, um, nausea, and we often, you know, we use the term intolerance, but as you said, it's not necessarily something that is even um, due to your biome or your genetics. It could be just that you have eaten too much of something, 
um, and <laughs> you become intolerant to that amount. So if you take mega doses of vitamin C, that will cause diarrhea. You aren't intolerant to vitamin C, you've just taken too much of it. Or if you take in too much fiber, I, you know, I really promote in, in ingesting sufficient fiber, but I don't promote ingesting so much that then you have gas and bloating and diarrhea. So you, there's the upper limit of fiber looks to be about 70 grams per day. Um, and in men, we want to get about 38 grams and women, it's about 25 or about 14 grams per thousand calories that you're eating. So in most cases, people, even if they're eating a very high calorie diet, aren't going to reach that threshold of fiber intake. But if they do, then it's just a matter of reducing fibrous carbohydrates and switching them out for some of the refined carbohydrates. Because in most cases, people who are eating at those levels are athletes, and we're going to have a place for those refined carbohydrates in their diet anyway. So one example of um, sort of a group of foods that may cause people more issues would be the FODMAP. So those are fermentable um, saccharides that are found in really a wide variety of foods. Dairy is one that's really common. A lot of people have lactose intolerance, um, but we find it in, in a wide variety of grains and fruits as well. And so if you are experiencing regular bouts of bloating and gas, you may just want to take a look at your diet. And if you're eating, some of the big ones are garlic and onions, which, you know, they're delicious. But um, if you're eating those regularly, um, many of the cruciferous vegetables, um, also grains, and it's not, a lot of people get confused about gluten. Now, gluten is a protein <laughs> and people can have an allergy to gluten. Whether or not gluten sensitivity exists hasn't been conclusively proven or disproven. There may actually be other um, enzymes in wheat that cause uh, an immune response, not in the same way that gluten would in a person who actually has an allergy. But, um, you know, in, and, and these are limited too, because a lot of these are done in cell culture models. And so, you know, if you apply uh, media with this enzyme in it, then you, then the, the, those cells respond with an immune, you know, uh, elevation in immune activity. So we see increased markers of inflammation. Whether or not we can extrapolate that to humans, you know, it's, it's, difficult to say and it's those are difficult studies to do because um, it's you in a cell culture model you know you just have easy access to those cells in a human if you want to determine what's happening at a, in their intestinal cells you have to take a sample of those intestinal cells and um, that's very invasive and it's very expensive so um, you know I'm not saying that you know there we know that gluten uh, uh, sensitivity it does or does not exist because I think that there's enough evidence on both sides that that I wouldn't say one way or the other is conclusive um, but just know that if you do remove foods that had gluten in them and you feel better it wasn't necessarily the gluten hmm. it could have been one of the enzymes or it could have been one of the fibers in that food so you know saying and and, and <laughs> There are, uh, now people are getting on sort of the carnivore diet train where they don't yeah. eat any plant foods at all. It's 100% <laughs> meat. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Um, and so they say, well, you know, my poops feel a lot better now that I'm not eating fiber. Fiber must have been the problem. Well, that's sort of like saying red lights cause traffic jams. You know, that may have been a, a factor, but it's not the causative factor. It's not that fiber was the thing giving you uncomfortable bowel movements. Could have been a whole host of factors. Mm. Um, so I think it's just very important that we don't you know, apply causation where there's only a correlation. Um, but I will say that I think that the attention on, on gluten sensitivity, you know, whether or not it exists, has really um, benefited people with celiac because now, you know, and, and even just the, the entire I mean, having focus on gut health, that now this is something that we're really looking into. Um, and we have far more, you know, uh, dietary options. And, and so it's not a bad thing, you know, even though sometimes it gets uh, overstated, we may 
play things out a little bit. You know, I think that there's benefit in drawing more attention. Just like, you know, I, I, it's great that we have lactose-free milk because I'm lactose intolerant. So it's great that I can ingest that and, you know, I have those options. So I think that, you know, this the, this attention actually kind of propels the food industry forward. And, and that's a good thing, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah, for sure. I think it almost goes two ways. It's you can undermine the severity and seriousness of the mm -hmm. disease and those who do have allergies, but at the same time, it's doing a lot of good things in terms of, um, you know, furthering the research and having a better understanding of the mechanisms at play. But moving forward, some interesting uh, points you, you mentioned were uh, food enzymes and digestive enzymes. And something that I've definitely experienced personally and also uh, with a lot of my clients is that when you eliminate a certain food for a long period of time and then you reintroduce it, you typically binge on this food. And this is what we see a lot of the time. You know, people cut out ice cream. Uh, they cut out, you know, all forms of, you know, refined carbohydrates there on their diet. And then they'll, mm -hmm. they'll have an eating episode or a binge or whatever it is. And they feel like crap and they say, oh, you know, that it was the lactose. You know, I'm intolerant. I'm insensitive to this. Um, but the body's a very adaptive organism. And if we slowly introduce foods, uh, can we actually increase uh, the threshold level for what we can tolerate for specific food enzymes? And is there, you know, more at play here? It's not that we, you know, uh, have this low threshold. Is that uh, threshold level for specific food enzymes uh, pliable? Well, when we're looking at the what actually enters the stomach and then the small intestine and the large intestine, the food is not identifiable. Um, so we have digestive enzymes that act in the mouth. We have a different set that are active in the stomach and then yet a different set that are active in the small intestine and in the large intestine. Um, now we don't get a lot of um, digestion and absorption in the large intestine. That's really the site where we have more bacterial fermentation. Um, we may have some, some liquid absorption, and we don't have uh, absorption in the stomach as well. So when we think about the process of digestion and absorption, chemical and mechanical digestion occur in the mouth and the stomach, absorption primarily in the small intestine, and then the large intestine, again, very little absorption, and it's more for our bacterial activity, and that's where we start to really um, form stool. So when you have proteins, entering the stomach or entering the small intestine, they don't look like, it, you, your body can't tell whether it's from chicken or it's from milk or it's a plant protein. They're broken down to their building blocks. Mm -hmm. So instead of a three-dimensional functional protein in the stomach, it's unfolded and broken apart into peptides, so short series of amino acids. And then in the small intestine, it's broken down even further until we are getting down to what actually enters the enterocyte and what, what goes into the bloodstream. We're looking, well, in the enterocyte, they, peptides can go in there, but what actually will enter in the bloodstream, we're looking at single amino acids. So the enzymes that are used to break these things down are all, it's the same enzymes for, for any protein, for any lipid, for any carbohydrate. So whether your um, carbohydrates came from because we really we only have three main disaccharides. So you may have uh, sucrose that came from table sugar. That sucrose is always going to be broken down by sucrase, regardless of how you ate that table sugar. Um, if we're looking at starch, lots of glucose. So we have a few different digestive en enzymes for that, but salivary amylase is one. So that salivary amylase will break down starches regardless of where it came from. Um, when we look at our uh, digestive enzymes for um, uh, peptides, we have different peptidases, and those are going to act on peptides from any source, whether it's a plant protein or it is a protein from chicken breast or dairy or cheese. So when we look at our digestive enzymes, it's not that we have a set for like ice cream mm -hmm. or pizza. It's just that we have sets for carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. And so what probably is, is occurring in those cases, especially when we're talking about, you know, uh, an episode of really hyper palatable foods, 
is just that you have, you know, perhaps yes, an, an excess of, of lactose, and if you have a lac, uh, lactose, uh, lactase deficiency, then you know that's going to cause issues. But um, dumping a, a bunch of carbohydrate into the small intestine, and then in, even in the large intestine, you're still going to get some that's uh, showing up there. Your bacteria are going to have a heyday with that, and so what you're probably looking at there is just a lot of bacterial fermentation. And they can they, they can ferment other things too, like they can metabolize amino acids. Um, and so you're looking at you know their products are primarily going to be short chain fatty acids and gases, and that's really what you're seeing. It's not that you necessarily have an enzyme deficiency. It's just that you have a lot of foodstuffs there, and those bacteria are fermenting them and producing a lot of gas. And that gas can then actually inhibit gastric transit. Mm -hmm. um, so you may have some constipation there. Lipids uh, are great at lubricating transit. And so if you have a really high lipid meal, then you may find that you lose more fat in that stool and that will make it more liquid. And so there are a lot of factors that can go into, you know, the gastric upset that follows an episode like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say enzyme deficiency would be probably the one of the, the least likely factors. Yeah. For sure. And in terms of when we uh, regularly expose ourselves to, you know, I guess, adequate uh, dosages of, you know, specific uh, food enzyme, uh, you know, the body is quite capable of digesting it. And, you know, I would want you to clarify and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, we become more efficient at producing digestive enzymes the more regularly we consume uh, a certain food enzyme. Is that correct? Um, we produce digestive enzymes in response to uh, really, well, in, in the intestines, we produce digestive enzymes in response to what enters the duodenum. That's the portion of the small intestine that's closest to the stomach. So your stomach, like I said, it contains its own digestive enzymes. Um, as we produce more uh, stomach acid, that actually activates some of the enzymes that may have been in their inert form, especially when we're talking about um, protein digestion. Um, but interestingly, the, the digestion of carbohydrates sort of turns off in the stomach because our, the digestive enzymes that are active in our mouth, that are happy at the pH in our mouth, in the stomach, it may be too acidic for them. So digestion of specific macronutrients actually changes if we're talking about the mouth versus the stomach. Then the contents that go from the stomach to the duodenum, we squirt out about two mils um, every time the stomach sort of churns. And then we, we, in response to that, because of the acidity of that, what we call chyme, the, the digested food products, because of the acidity there or the fat content there, then we'll produce even more digestive enzymes. So we have our pancreas has an endocrine function, but it also has an exocrine function because endocrine is inside of the body, exocrine is outside of the body. The lumen or the hole in the center of our intestines is actually external to the body. So we will produce digestive enzymes in response to the acidity and fat content of the chyme that's in, the, that's in that first section of the small intestine of the duodenum. Um, in some cases, we may have, um, you know, uh, an inefficiency. There, so there is actually a diagnosable disease of exocrine pancreatic inefficiency where we're not producing sufficient digestive enzymes, especially to break down fats. Um, and that can result in severe chronic gastrointestinal upset. But in most cases, people are producing sufficient enzymes. And so, you know, unless you've been diagnosed with something like that, then you are producing enzymes in response to whatever is entering the duodenum. And then we have enzymes that are um, present in the gut. And, you know, yes, we may need to produce more of them sort of on call, um, but it's not that, you know, it, with one caveat. So can you train the gut? Yes. And we look at this more in terms of endurance exercise and, and endurance athletes training the gut so that they can consume um, nutrients and then be able to readily utilize those nutrients during intense activity. Because when we're looking at intense activity, especially upwards of, you know, past about 80% VO2 max, we do see that there's uh, a reduction in, in 
um, gastric emptying. So things start to, you know, kind of sit in the stomach a little bit more. Um, but training the gut is not just about the gut function, but also about putting the proper concentration of carbohydrates into the gut because we want to make sure that it's not too concentrated and not too dilute, that we're using the proper ratio of carbohydrates because it's not just about digestive enzymes, it's also about um, uptake into the absorptive cells of the intestine and that is done primarily through protein channels on their cell membranes. And some of those are based on, some of those use passive diffusion, some of them can use active transport. And so um, if we use too many things that are, are based on just that, that move across just by diffusion, um, they may actually hang out in the gut a little bit longer and then through the process of osmosis, pull in more water and then you get dumping because you have too much water in the lumen. So there are so many factors that go into comfortably digesting your food that, you know, it's no wonder that people have, um, most people experience, especially endurance athletes, experience gastric upset because there are so many factors. Um, but I would say that in terms of, you know, to, to speak directly to whether you can train, you know, or, or increase your production of enzymes, um, because they're already going to be present, you don't necessarily have to do that work. If you do have an enzyme deficiency, it's not something that you can actually mm. change because that is from the genetic blueprint that you have. You don't have the right recipe for that. And so you can't make that thing. If you want to think about, you know, our genetic information as sort of a recipe book, if you have the wrong recipe, you can't make that item. Awesome. Awesome. And I guess to bring this uh, full circle back to how we can, uh, you know, manage or improve our gut health, what would be your key tips? Because obviously we have that one third that's species specific. We can't change that, but we do have that inter-individual variability, that 15, 20% diet related. And we've sort of touched on that uh, as well as the physical activity, but any uh, other I guess, abstract uh, tips that you might have that are a little bit less common uh, than the just the, you know, eat more vegetables and exercise regularly kind of thing. Yeah. Um, there have been some pretty interesting studies done in rodent models that have started to elucidate some of the things we've seen in human studies that, that, that gave us an answer but didn't explain the mechanisms. So some of this is, you know, it's very theoretical, and, and I always say that, you know, mouse models are limited, but so are human models when we're looking at the biome, because in most cases, human models, when we are, yeah, well, yeah, that's a big <laughs> one. Yeah, you can, when you're done with the mites, you can kill them and take their intestines out, you can do that with people. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so realizing, I think, one thing that's important, when we're looking at effects of anything in the human microbiome in many cases they're looking at fecal samples fecal samples are actually very different from the bacterial profile of the small intestine and the large intestine they are a little bit more representative of the large intestine but even the large and small intestine are significantly different and they are significantly different from the stomach if you take a cross section of the intestines and you look at the what's hanging out in the lumen, the circle in the middle versus what's hanging out in the mucus that covers the intestinal cells, those are significantly different as well. So I think it's important to note that what we what knowledge we have thus far in human subjects, especially when it's related to these larger studies, these larger epidemiological studies looking at the correlates between diet and the biome, that fecal samples are not telling us the whole picture. That's especially important with probiotic studies because uh, in, a, in a couple of recent really intricate and well done studies, they actually did take a very invasive uh, approach and they actually tested, they took samples from everywhere from the stomach all the way down to the colon in humans and looked at whether probiotics would enrich their, their guts and exactly where. And they found that although everyone similarly shed probiotics in their stool, not all of the participants were enriched by those probiotics. So knowing that there haven't really been, there haven't been studies in humans that show that the probiotics are enriching or that they're enriching in the appropriate place, which is ideally we want them in the large intestine. Um, so that's something to 
keep in mind as I as I go through all this. So um, I guess that's the first thing though with probiotics. A lot of people are really on the probiotics bandwagon, and um, there's good support for their use in reducing symptoms associated with inflammatory bowel diseases and irritable bowel syndrome in terms of reducing bouts of constipation, diarrhea, gas and bloating um, in humans. And so, you know, in that case, does the mechanism, and we want to know the mechanism, but if it makes you feel better, if we have actual mm -hmm. markers for, you know, improved function, that at the end of the day is what is really important. But in terms of, you know, claims that they can um, improve, vastly improve mental health or metabolic health, the support for that isn't as strong. And I think what's um, also interesting with uh, the probiotics is the placebo and uh, nocebo mm -hmm. you know, effect that they have. And typically when people do start taking them, they're not drinking a bunch of alcohol, you know, they're not eating a bunch of pizza or takeaway, they clean up their diet. And it's like, oh, these probiotics are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing is, you know, that's that's the other issue. We don't have a lot of studies with good dietary controls with these interventions. Um, you know, even in so the, the the limited amount of studies we have in exercise, where we're looking at you know correlations between specific uh, taxa of bacteria and people who are physically active. We can only say, well, uh, we told them to stick with the same diet that they've been doing. Um, and then there were there have been just a couple in resistance training, um, and those people lost weight and had whey protein supplementation. And so we have many other variables that you know we have to we can run regression analyses, and people do that, and that's how we sort of come up with this you know perhaps 15 to 20 percent due to physical activity or due to um, diet. But it's very hard to come up with something that even approaches causation in those cases. Now in rodents. We have um, developed some really interesting interventions and methods in, in approaching something that, you know, is, is a very, very strong correlation. I say, like, we can't really prove anything, you know, and show causation. We just infinitely approach it like a logarithmic line on a graph <laughs> without actually ever touching it. Um, but in rodents, we actually have been able to determine that a high-fat diet alone, even without obesity, causes changes in the microbiome because we can feed all mice, all of the mice, a high-fat diet, and then you know we have a control group, but prevent obesity through pharmaceutical means in mice. And, and they will still have changes to the microbiome, which actually makes sense because those bacteria uh, have to compete for nutrients and real estate and will, just like in, in any ecosystem, if you remove the food source of an organism, it will die. And so if we remove fibers from the diet and then have a diet that's instead very high in, in amino acids, then the the bacteria that primarily subsist on fibers will die off, and then we'll have instead an increase in um, mucin integrators and those that can metabolize proteins. So it's really not a huge surprise that we can see, you know, changes in the microbiome from diet alone, independent of obesity. Um, but it looks like obesity, a diet, a high-fat diet, and sedentary lifestyle, even though they can all have individual effects do also have an additive effect. So if you're going to, you know, pick two out of three, <laughs> high fat diet and obesity, then exercising in mice seems to bring the biome back to what, what it would look like in a sedentary mouse. So exercise, you, you can't outrun your diet, but if you exercise, you can at least prevent some of the negative changes associated with being uh, obese or having a high fat diet. Or if you are obese and sedentary, but you eat a diet that's low in fat and high in fiber, then you will be promoting the growth of beneficial bacteria. So as much as you can, you know, try and if you can do all three, exercise, eat a low fat diet and, and maintain a healthy body weight, that's ideal. But know that, you know, even if you can't do all of those things, as many as you can, that will have an additive effect to the biome. We know that the biome plays such an important role in, in, in body weight regulation through similar studies done in mice where we can actually take a mouse that has no gut bacteria 
and give him the gut bacteria of an obese mouse and he will then become obese. He doesn't necessarily have to eat more to become obese. So that's the surprising thing. In some cases, the mice will eat more. They'll have to eat increased food intake. In other cases, they will actually just extract more energy from the diet. This is a double-edged sword. So um, I remember talking about this in, in grad school and a um, group came in to talk about um, the comparison between formicutes that I mentioned earlier that are obesogenic versus the bacteroidetes that were considered to be lean. And to them, formicutes were great. They thought that this was gonna be a really good intervention for people in developing countries who had um, severe energy malnutrition. Uh, so, you know, they just, didn't, they, they don't have access to food and they're primarily subsisting off things like polished rice um, or, or grains. And so for them, eating less refined carbohydrates could actually be a great thing to increase this formicutes count, increase energy harvesting from the diet. For us, it's not necessarily a great thing. Um, so in, in that case, you know, we have sort of approached something, although, you know, there's still a chicken and egg uh, question when it comes to humans because we haven't gotten a human who's totally germ free and then transplanted, um, you know, the gut microbiome from someone else. But keeping in mind that even though energy balance is king, we know we know that you know we have to be in a negative energy balance to lose weight. That even if you estimate that you're in a correct energy balance, but you are consistently not losing weight. It could be because you do have an enhanced capability of harvesting energy from the diet because of your gut. And so given two people that are of you know, the same height, weight, so all anthropomorphics are the same, physical activity is the same, one person may still need to eat less than the other because they have increased energy harvesting capabilities. Wow. So, wow. I know. So not the person, I mean, and I don't want people to use that as a scapegoat. It's not that you can't, you know, you can still lose the weight. You just may have to eat less than, than someone else. But, you know, assuming that you are um, you know, eating a, a low fat diet, that actually can also have an, a beneficial effect in appetite regulation as well, because these fibers um, that are commended to short chain fatty acids, um, one of them uh, in particular, butyrate has been tied to um, increased appetite regulation, so appetite suppression. So, and fiber does that really through mechanical means as well. So if you have mechanical and chemical means of appetite regulation, it may be easier for you then to stick to um, your energy deficit. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we've overshot the time here, Gabrielle, <laughs> and I wanted to uh, ask you a couple of extra questions, but I think we're going to have to get you on again to, to discuss uh, those and go into a different realm of uh, nutritional chats, but that was fantastic and very detailed and in-depth, and where can the listeners find you, more importantly? Uh -huh. They can find me on Instagram. I'm Vitamin PhD. Um, I'm also Vitamin PhD on Facebook, and I have a website with a blog that I do not update often enough, um, but that's vitaminphdnutrition.com. They can contact me there. Um, that's also where I post all of my podcasts, and you know, for upcoming seminars, like I'll be you know, out in Australia yeah. next year. Yes, I can't wait. Um, I'll be in Southern California uh, this Sunday, and so if they want you know to purchase tickets, I'll be putting links up there. So, um, and and if they reach out to me on Instagram, send me messages. I always respond. I really appreciate the support and answer questions as much as I can. Awesome, you're an absolute legend, Gabrielle. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll speak to you next time. Thank you. Awesome.